American privilege is blurring my vision. Inherited sickness. I Did you know that the first recorded date of Christmas being celebrated on the 25th of December was actually in 336 AD? This was during the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine. He was the first Christian Roman Emperor. A few years later, Pope Julius I officially declared the 25th of December as the date that the birth of Jesus would be celebrated. Now, December 25th might have been chosen because the winter solstice and the ancient Roman midwinter festivals called Saturnalia and Dias Nautilus Solus Invicti took place in December around this date. So it was a time when people already celebrated things. But there is strong biblical evidence against the fact that Christ was truly born on December 25th. In fact, most theologians and historians believe that Christ was born in the spring, sometime between March and April. So today, using the Word of God, let's see if we can discover Christ's actual birthday. Some of you might ask, why is it important to know what day Jesus was born? And to that I answer, it's the day that God became a human being, the day that the Word became flesh. Don't you want to know what day in history that that actually happened? To begin with, we need to understand the death of King Herod. If you remember, King Herod tried to kill baby Jesus. So Joseph took Jesus and ran away to Egypt. The family took refuge in Egypt, and when they heard King Herod had died, they went back to Israel. Let's read Matthew 2.15. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Here it says that they were there until the death of King Herod. And Matthew 2, 19 and 20. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who saw the child's life are dead. See, here it says that when Herod died, the angel came to Joseph in a dream and said that those who sought for the baby's life were dead, so go back to Israel. So it's important to know when King Herod died. Now, King Herod died sometime between March 29th and April 4th that year. Stay with me and I'll explain how these dates are reached. Historically, King Herod died in the year 4 BC. March 29th in the year 4 BC is the solar calendar date, the Gregorian date if you will. However, according to the Hebrew religious calendar, March 29th of that year is the first day of the first month. Historical records show that Herod died in the 34th year of his reign. The Jewish people didn't use the solar calendar, but the religious calendar to figure out the regnal years of the kings. So starting from March 28th and before, that would have been King Herod's 33rd year of reign. And after March 29th, it would officially be King Herod's 34th year of reign. So March 28th is the last day of King Herod's 33rd year of regnal reign. So if Herod died in the 34th year of his reign, he would have had to have died after March 29th of that year. Now how did we reach April 4th? In this year, the year 4 BC, Passover was April 11th. From the Jewish calendar, March 29th is the first day of the first month, and Passover is on the 14th day of the first month. So that means that March 29th is the first day of the month, and April 11th becomes the 14th day of the month. Now the Greek historian Flavius Josephus records that on that day, the king was Archelaus, the son of Herod, not Herod himself. That means that Herod had already died before that day. Josephus also wrote that after Archelaus became king, he had a time of mourning for seven days. He mourned Herod for seven days, so Herod's death had to have occurred at least seven days prior to April 11th, so that would have been April 4th. This means that Herod died sometime between March 29th and April 4th. Now why is it important that we know when Herod died? If Herod does not die, baby Jesus cannot go to Jerusalem to perform the purification rites. See, Jesus came to earth to fulfill the law. That's why in Matthew 5.17 the Bible says, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So since Jesus came to fulfill the law, Jesus has to abide by the law. He has to keep the law. That means that Jesus didn't completely ignore the law at all times, but in situations where he could fulfill the law and keep the law, he did those things. So now we need to understand the purification rite. Under the Old Testament law, when a woman gives birth to a baby, she has to go through a purification rite. So the second thing we need to understand is that purification rite. 
When she has a baby boy, she is unclean for seven days. Then after that, she needs to go through 33 days of a cleansing ritual. When you combine these, you get 40 days before she is completely purified. That means a mother who has given birth cannot go into the temple or even touch any of the items within the sanctuary for 40 days. Then, on the 41st day, the mother goes into the temple to give her offering of sacrifice, which will make her fully purified. This is God's law, so Mary and baby Jesus also have to keep this law. So on the 41st day, they have to go into the temple to perform this purification ritual. However, if King Herod is still alive, they cannot go into the temple to perform this. In order for Jesus to go through this 41-day ritual, God had to kill King Herod. Let's read Luke 2.22. And when the days for her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Here, it says that the days of purification were completed. The word in Greek here is pletho, which means it's full. This means when the 41st day came, when the days were full, Mary and baby Jesus came to worship God. In other words, it wasn't a little less or a little more than 41 days. It was exactly 41 days that they came back to Jerusalem for this ritual. So in order for them to fulfill God's will, he enabled them to come right on the 41st day so they could fulfill those days. Let's read Leviticus 12 verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days. As in the days of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for thirty-three days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. If you know exactly what day Jesus performed this purification right, then you can count back forty-one days to his birth. Now hold on to that thought and let's shift gears for a moment. I want to focus for a minute on where Jesus took refuge in Egypt. Here's a map of the Mediterranean. Here, this area, is where Cairo is located. Many people think that Jesus took refuge in that area. This spot here is Jerusalem, and right under it here is Bethlehem. So to come from Bethlehem all the way here is about 250 to 265 miles. Now the Sinai Peninsula in the wilderness is full of rocks. Not even a single blade of grass grows there. Matthew 2 verse 11 through 13 states, After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. When we look at this passage, it says on the night of Jesus' birth, Herod was going to kill the babies. So on that night, they ran away. They fled. Now, they have an infant child and a mother who was not healed from her wounds. To walk through the wilderness, would that make sense? In those days, the border between Israel and Egypt was here. This place here is called the Brook of Egypt. And right across the border is a place called El Arish. El Arish is about 91 miles from Bethlehem. That is a more plausible location for where baby Jesus took refuge, isn't it? They say a male adult can walk between 15 and 25 miles a day. So El Arish is a place you could flee to in a few days. So one can safely assume that Jesus took refuge in El Arish. And after Herod died, God called baby Jesus back to Israel. Matthew 2.15 states, He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. It says that Jesus' time in Egypt was a fulfillment of Hosea 11.1, 1, which says, Out of Egypt I called my son. So now we can understand exactly where in Egypt Jesus fled. So we can conjecture that baby Jesus fled into Egypt, and that is where he was circumcised because he was circumcised on the eighth day. Let's read Genesis 17 verses 10 through 14. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in your house, who is bought with money from any foreigner, who is not of your descendants, 
A servant who is born in your house, who is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Here it says circumcision has to be done on the eighth day. So even if Mary had just given birth, she could travel the 91 mile journey to El Arish in just eight days. Luke 2 verses 21 through 22 states, And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It says circumcision was performed on the eighth day. And in verse 22 it says, According to the law of Moses, they performed the rite of purification. That means verse 21 was eight days after the birth of Christ, and verse 22 was something that happened 41 days after Jesus' birth. So there is a 33-day gap between these two verses. Now we're almost there. Let's see if we can come to an understanding about the time and distance of travel between these places. What's important here is the date of April 11th. This is very important. In 4 BC, April 11th was Passover. So on April 11th, at twilight, just before sunset, they killed the Passover lamb. If you look at Exodus 12, verses 1 through 6, it says they take the Passover lamb on the 10th day of the first month, and on the 14th day, they slaughtered the lamb. Passover, in the year 4 BC, on the solar calendar, is April 11th. Now, on the eve of April 11th, the Israelites started to give sacrifices. However, due to events that had transpired prior to his father's death, King Archelaus had to send a tribune in command of a cohort to reason with a group of people mourning the loss of two teachers and forty youth that his father had killed for destroying a golden eagle that he had placed over the temple, and wait until Archelaus could return from Rome and then he would deal with this. However, those who came from Archelaus were stoned, and many of them were killed. So the Greek historian Josephus records that after midnight, Archelaus suddenly ordered the entire army within the city to the temple. Josephus records that the death toll that night was 3,000 people, and Archelaus sent heralds around the city announcing the cancellation of Passover. Now imagine that, Passover. Everyone from all over the nation would come to Jerusalem, but on April 12th, the king sent them all away to their homes. That means that Mary and Joseph could not perform the purification rite on the 12th. When Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem to perform the purification rite, they met Simeon and Anna. And when they were performing the purification rite, they were not bothered by any soldiers. This means that they must have performed the rite before April 12th. Because on April 12th, they could not perform any of these rituals. Now in order to know about the route of travel, we need to figure out the distance between El Arish and Nazareth. A lot of people think that Mary and Joseph went straight from El Arish directly to Jerusalem to perform the rituals. That's why they can't figure out what the Bible means, because the Bible clearly states that they didn't go straight from El Arish to Jerusalem. But first went to Nazareth of Galilee. Let's read Matthew 2, verses 19 through 23. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Clearly, the Bible states that Joseph was afraid to go to Jerusalem, so he went to live in Galilee. Now from El Arish to Nazareth is about 150 miles. This is a distance that they could make in about six days. Remember that we've already discussed now that an adult male usually walks 15 to 25 miles a day. If you're really slow, you can make it about 15 miles a day. And if you walk fast, you can cover 25 miles a day, especially if you have a donkey. You just throw all of your luggage or the woman and the baby on the donkey. Exodus 4.20 is an example of this. Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey. It says that Moses brought his children and says that he put them on a donkey as he walked. Also, in a separate instance, from Beersheba to Jerusalem, about 50 miles, Abraham put all of his things on a donkey and he and Isaac walked a three-day journey this means that they walk two full days. If you divide 50 by two days, you walk 25 miles a day. So we can see, if they had a donkey, they could cover 25 miles a day. If Joseph had placed Mary and Jesus riding on a donkey, they could have covered 25 miles a day. 
It was also customary in those days to have women and children ride on donkeys during a long journey. Some people say that Joseph and Mary were really poor, so where did they get the donkey from? Remember the Magi's? They brought gifts for Christ. One of those gifts was gold. They had gold. They could sell the gold and buy eight donkeys if they wanted to. So the distance that they would have covered is about 150 miles. It would have taken them around six days. Next we have to think about the distance from Nazareth back to Jerusalem. From Nazareth it is about 65 miles to Jerusalem. However going from Nazareth to Jerusalem is an uphill journey so it takes a little longer. We can assume that it took them somewhere around three days to make it. So nine days of travel total. Another thing we also have to take into consideration is the Sabbath day. They can't travel on the Sabbath. In the year 4 BC, April 7th was the Sabbath. And a lot of scholars think King Herod died somewhere around April 1st. So let's put all of this together. Let's say this is the month of April. Here we have the 1st when Herod supposedly died. And here we have the 7th, which is the Sabbath. Let's say early in the morning of April 1st they start out. They can walk 6 days, cover 150 miles from El Arish to Nazareth. Then on the 7th day, this is the Sabbath. So they can't go anywhere. They prepare a place to live and gather the things that they will need to perform at the purification rite when they reach Jerusalem. So if they start to leave on the 8th day, they can arrive in Jerusalem on the 10th. They could perform the purification rites before God on the morning of the 11th. Then after they finish, they can return to Nazareth because that's where they continue to live. Now remember, on the eve of the 11th and into the 12th, Archelaus killed 3,000 people. When you take all of these things into account, it is correct to say King Herod died on April 1st. And when you count 41 days backwards from April 11th, Passover in the year 4 BC, you come to the date of March 2nd in the year 4 BC. That is the day that Jesus must have been born in order for Mary to fulfill the purification rites on the morning of the 11th. So Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, the seed of the woman, promised to Adam, who came to destroy the works of the devil, was born on Friday, March the 2nd, in the year 4 BC. Now how's that for Christmas trivia? Share that one with your family at Christmas dinner and show everyone how smart you are.